This is the BBC World Service. I'm Katia Adler in Brussels. Welcome to World Questions, the programme which puts the public at the heart of the debate. This month, we're looking at the European Union. I'm joined remotely by a panel of leading politicians and policymakers from across Europe and by members of the public with their questions. Our audience, brought together with help from our partners, the British Council, will put those questions to the panel, and there is lots to talk about. Brexit. A deal may have been struck, but how much damage has it caused the EU? The coronavirus pandemic and how the European Union has responded, immigration, the budget, political division and foreign policy. So much to chat through. So let me tell you who we're going to be talking to today, our wonderful panel. From Berlin in Germany, we're joined by Dr. Katja Leichhardt. She's from Angela Merkel's governing Christian Democratic Union Party, and she's the CDU spokeswoman on Europe and a member of the Bundestag. Hello, Katja. Eva Kaili is in the Greek capital, Athens. She's a member of the European Parliament representing the Social Democrats. Hello to you, Eva. Hi. In Warsaw, Poland, we've got our second member of the European Parliament, Dominik Tajinski from Poland's governing Law and Justice Party. Hello, Dominic. Hello from Warsaw. And from Italy, I'm joined by Natalie Tocci, who's the director of the Institute for International Affairs. It's a think tank based in Rome. Welcome to you, Natalie, and to all of you. So we go now, of course, to our first question. It's from a high school pupil from Bari in southern Italy. Lucia, what is your question for our panel today? Uh, hello, um, it's Lucia here. Thanks for having me. So my question is about the situation that Italy is living. Uh, as I think you know, uh, Italy has been uh, badly hit by coronavirus. So my question is, what help can the EU offer to those countries most badly affected by the pandemic? Thank you, Lucia. Obviously, Natalie, this is your, your home country. But if you forgive me, I'm going to turn to, to Katia, first of all, um, because Germany has just had uh, the presidency of the European Union, which changes every six months. And during Germany's presidency, uh, a recovery budget has been agreed uh, for the European Union. And I think it's important, isn't it, to point out that it's not just aimed at countries um, who've had such a terrible health crisis. Italy, of course, has got one of the worst, uh, highest death rates uh, in Europe, but also those countries economically uh, most affected uh, by the pandemic. Is it enough, Katia? Well, first of all, Lucia, thanks for your question. And uh, we are all aware that Italy is really struck hard by the crisis. And um, what we did here in my parliamentary group and in Germany is to support strongly um, the um, Next Generation EU fund with a historic volume of 750 billion euros. And um, we are convinced this will be a huge help for the countries, member states, which suffer most. And um, since you're very young, and um, I can promise that we try to spend this money uh, for, for the future of your generation, we um, plan to spend 30% of this 750 billion fund um, for future investments like um, making the European Union more greener, for example, for more digitization. And this is how we try to help um, uh, that Europe can recover quickly. Um, so, uh, Dominic, I, I'd like to turn to you, actually, because, as, as I said, it, it's not uh, Italy is getting a large chunk of the recovery funds, but uh, it's also countries whose economy has been particularly badly hit in the European Union that will be receiving funds. Poland is, is included there. Um, but as Katia was just saying, there are certain strings attached. Poland is famous, uh, very famous in Brussels for not wanting to be bossed around by Brussels. Do you accept being... Uh, guided, advised, told, instructed what to do with the money that you receive to help with the pandemic? Well, first of all, as we heard from Berlin, this money will be spent in the future. 
we have to remember that this budget is for seven years and we need action now and what is the action from berlin at the moment now during the pandemic angela merkel is making a deal with putin she called him they had this conversation about the vaccine she broke the uh, agreement within the european union she broke our solidarity and she's starting her cooperation with putin on the vaccine on the vaccination which is against this uh th this contract which we all have i'm talking about 27 countries so this is the boss and the bossy attitude in practice this is not the first example of cooperation between berlin and moscow uh north stream 2 we have to repeat it we have to remember it and this is another example of this lack of solidarity COVID is spreading so quickly that we need action now and what is our response when we had this terrible um, situation on um, on uh, christmas eve in dover when hundreds thousands of drivers needed a help we sent our troops poland sent our army to help them we tested 2000 drivers we tested even a brazilian driver not only polish we tested drivers from around europe european commission did nothing berlin did nothing we took action and this is sh what should be done by european commission and mainly berlin germans who are calling themselves leader of the european union if leader is making business with russia i don't like it dominic thank thank you for your passionate intervention and natalie touch if i if i can turn to you that the question did come from uh, lucia in italy italy has suffered uh, very much during the covid 19 crisis um did did you um feel that the COVID crisis has helped to uncover wounds that exist in the European Union. We're hearing there from, from Dominic uh, in Warsaw. Uh, resentment, is this a mess? Does this expose the weakness of the European Union? Well, no, Katia, I would say exactly the opposite. I think this crisis has helped heal the wounds that have been there over, particularly that uh, emerged over the last decade. Wounds that emerged first over the Eurozone crisis that then exacerbated over the so-called migration crisis. And let's face it, if there had been a failure of the European Union in this third crisis, it would have probably been a crisis too many. I think it would have probably meant the end of the European project. And I think European leaders understood this uh, and came up with a significant package. I mean, I don't think we should underestimate how significant 750 billion actually are. Now, you're absolutely right. This is an economic response to the crisis. But hey, this is where the competence of the European Union lies. I mean, it's not a coincidence that it's precisely the fact that there, there is not a competence on health policy, that now there is a discussion about increasing competences of the European Union in the health domain. So I think the European Union, in all honesty, uh, did what it could, and it did it pretty well, and in, in, in a pretty meaningful way. Uh, and I think if we look at, for instance, Italy, from where the question was, was coming from, indeed in the first few weeks of the pandemic, there was the sense of the European Union not responding fast enough and, and, and not really appreciating the depth of the crisis. We're in a different universe now. I mean, now the truth is that if we don't manage to spend properly the close to 200 billion that will actually get to Italy, it will be our fault and our fault alone as Italians. And there's no finger pointing to Brussels or Berlin that can be done. Eva, could I, could I ask you uh, for Greece, um, the fact that uh, the European Union wants to influence how recovery money is spent, um, there was a shiver that went through uh, Greece uh, initially, um, the idea of looking back to the financial crisis and, and, and 2015. Do you feel as Natalie that although at the beginning of the crisis, uh, the EU didn't seem to handle it very well on behalf of all its members, it's now very much on track looking at the whole single market, every member state, to help it recover? Yes, of course. I need to clarify that Europe doesn't have the competency to have a European uh, health strategy. So very fast, we try to come together and decide how we can coordinate. We still have shortcomings. So I will agree with Dominic. We had Germany acting uh, on its own as, uh, as it's actually happening quite often, but mainly we managed to coordinate and uh, uh, basically yesterday we had this um, uh, discussion in the parliament where we 
understood that we have 2 billion vaccines uh, already ordered for um, to cover the European population. So I think we managed to make sure that Europe will feel safe and they will have access to vaccines. In Greece, we are handling the situation quite well, uh, but still uh, we expect to see the consequences of this new wave of economic crisis. And we are just trying to recover from the previous austerity uh, crisis that we have and, and the terrible measures we had to follow. So I think we, we are doing more things than when Greece was left alone in the previous crisis. Okay, Eva, thank you uh, very much. Can I turn back to you, Lucia, in Bari, in Italy? Do you feel that your question was, was answered? Do you have anything else to add? No, uh, it was very, very clear. I think that if I can say that Europe is doing great, I think that now the problem is how each country will face the situation. Thank you for your thoughts, Lucia, and thank you for joining us uh, on, uh, on World Questions as well. So we move now swiftly on to uh, question number two. Um, it comes from Greece. Uh, Ekaterini uh, Statiras, Vice President of the Ionina Alpine Club. Over to you and your question, please. Hello. So speaking from Greece uh, and speaking actually on behalf of the Alpine and hiking clubs of Greece, uh, I would say I speak as a proxy of the nature of Greece. Uh, the situation is that foreign, mainly German and domestic wind turbine companies uh, destroy all our nature natura areas uh, with the blessings of the government who lifted the protection regime uh, for companies to make huge profits. So Greece is made up of pristine mountains and islands, and now hungry profit is unleashed to roam and ravage our beautiful country. Our mountains are about to be ripped out and gutted. Archaeological remains will be desecrated. All-time heritage places and islands will be destroyed. So what can you do to stop the new green energy economy destroying the environment? Thank you so much for your question. Eva Kaili, maybe if I could, if I could start uh, with you in Athens, this is about your home country in Greece. Do you feel that the nature of your country is being trampled uh, for profit? Uh, because we heard there uh, the finger being pointed at your government, at Germany in particular, when it comes to this, you know, wind farm organization. Um, what about EU regulations? The EU says protecting the environment is a number one priority. So I would say that Europe actually is one of the most ambitious players globally on achieving the targets of renewable energy and the Paris Climate Agreement. Uh, I understand that there is specific interest about windmills and specific organizations that deal with anything that's about to change their lives or their environment. And of course, there are pros and cons. We need to establish, and I think this is where we have some shortcomings, we need to establish um, a coordination agency where we can understand the special, um, uh, let's say, environmental conditions in each region before we give the permission for wind farms or for solar energy um, or for any other renewable um, energy. Because also the windmills, they, they um, increase the temperature of um, the, the place where they are, uh, where they are uh, located. Under the pandemic prism, we have now basically all the investments, all the funding that comes out of EU will have to have the prism of digitalization and green innovation. So this means we are doing actually the maximum with the, our responsibility um, towards the uh, environment. We, we expect to have zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. And Greece is uh, leading there, and uh, Greece is, is uh, proposing uh, special investments to take place because, as you know, we have the, um, the blessing to have uh, sunny weather 90% of the year, and also we can use the islands for um, production of, uh, of energy uh, through the wind mills. Okay, uh, Dominic, if I, if I can turn to you here. I mean, Eva was extolling the virtues of the European Union and wanting to cut emissions uh, to net zero by 2050, uh, Poland is the only member state uh, of the 27 that hasn't uh, signed up uh, to that goal. Although this autumn, there were sort of encouraging noises from the Polish government. Where do you stand now? We stand against hypocrisy. This is number one. If Germany, which was mentioned, it's not like I'm attacking Germany and, and German government, 
is opening a new coal miners, they're destroying the whole villages. We've got the news from Financial Times, June 20. The whole villages are destroyed and Germans are opening the new coal miners' plans. If they are continuing cooperation with Putin on Nord Stream 2, which will destroy Baltic Dominic, Sea. Dominic, I, I asked you about, about, no, may I please ask you to answer the question, will the Polish government sign up to the EU goal, it is the only member state that hasn't done so, to cutting emissions, uh, carbon emissions, by 2050? As you know, the signature is just a piece of paper. Action is the most important part of it. We are very happy to fight for the for the environment. We do fight it in Poland. We do not like hypocrisy and a bossy attitude from the hypocrites. Thank you very much. Katia, in Berlin, if I can turn to you, do you accept uh, that Germany talks about the environment but doesn't always act in favour uh, of the environment? We're also talking about, you know, uh, supporting the uh, the diesel industry at home as well as the coal industry. Well, uh, Ms. Ekaterini, um, we all love your country. Um, Eva pointed out the sun shining hours in, in Greece. First of all, I think it's all our European effort um, to um, fulfill um, the zero um, target by 2015. Um, Germany um, strongly supports this aim. Um, we are very ambitious um, at a national level. I mean, it's, um, Ms. Aikaterini, if I look in my constituency, it, we have um, the same debates on windmills. So, um, in the end, it's a trade-off. We, we all pay, pay our price either one or in the other direction. So, um, it's also for us here in Germany a really huge transformation. Um, look at the fact that in 2030 we will um, leave the coal mining sector which costs us 40 billion. So I'd like to come back to you, uh, Ekaterina Stateras. Do you feel that your question was answered? Do you, you said that you have more information to provide. What do you think should be done, in your words, to stop the green energy economy destroying the environment? Of course it was not answered, definitely. Neither by my Greek MP, nor by the German, of course. Uh, Everything is, hypocr is hypocritic, of course. Uh, all they want uh, is profit and money because uh, uh, the, t the reference target, which has to be achieved by 2030, has already been achieved by wind turbines, uh, which are installed out of Natura. Now they are installing many, many wind turbines inside Natura, inside uh, environmentally sensitive areas, and everybody turns a blind eye and a deaf ear. This is the hypocrisy of, the, of Europe. Make them reinstate the protection of Natura because they lifted the protection of Natura. So you tell me, do you tell me that you are destroying the nature to protect the nature? This is a shame on all the European members of Parliament. Thank you very, very much. We go to our third uh, question to Jim Monaghan, a former university lecturer uh, from Ireland. Um, so, and this is to Brexit, of course. Again, we'll have lots of opinions about Jim. Please, what's your question? Hi. Ireland is a small country dominated for centuries by the UK, even after independence. Brexit makes for huge difficulties. The UK is our biggest trading partner and Ireland has geographic difficulties. On balance, Ireland's destiny lies with the EU. But the EU needs to offer a bigger stimulus package and needs to assist Ireland and other places with, with the challenge of Brexit, but particularly Ireland. A penny-pinching narrow approach is the opposite of what is needed. We need a bold vision, and I am thinking of the Marshall Plan, which far exceeds what's on offer with the stimulus package. OK, uh, there is a fund uh, to help countries most impacted uh, by, uh, hit hardest by Brexit. Ireland uh, will be getting about 25% of the fund, which is about 5.4 uh, billion euros. Um, Natalie, touching in Rome, if I, if I could come to you, Jim clearly does not think uh, that the 5.4 billion euros is enough. Well, I mean, you know, 
it, it may well not be enough. The question whether it, it is, is whether in the circumstances uh, the EU did what it could have done. Now, I think that, you know, if we sort of rewind back to 2016, you know, this was a time in which we thought after the UK referendum that we would have seen a domino effect of other member states wanting to fall off uh, the union themselves. Now, this didn't happen. I think throughout the Brexit negotiation, uh, the 27 actually stuck together in a remarkable way. Uh, I think that it was actually remarkable that we succeeded in getting to a deal, uh, and it wasn't easy at the end of uh, last year. But the fact that an agreement is there, uh, with all of its imperfections, with all of its limitations, I think does actually mean that we can build uh, a more positive relationship. So, you, I mean, you're talking about a positive relationship. I think Jim is talking about pure economics. And obviously, when it comes to trade, I mean, Ireland is 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 losing out more than any other country. It's most affected uh, by Brexit in, in terms of sort of immediate trade. Uh, Dominic. Well, first of all, I do not understand why Germany is getting money for Brexit. I do not understand why first polluter in European Union is getting money. I do not understand why still why Germany is still the one who is making money on everything. That is just a fact. And uh, we have to remember that was the sovereign decision to leave EU for, 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 for the Brits, and we have to respect it. I lived, uh, I used to live in London for, for five years. I know Polish community in London. I know that they are secured with their rights. They still have their their, their workplaces, and, uh, and that's the most important from from mine Polish point of view. But this uh, this deal, um, it's not perfect. It's it's very gentle description. Uh, I, I would say we have to remember who is responsible for this chaos, Mr. Cameron and Mr. Tusk. I'm very sorry to say that that Mr. Tusk, who was the president of the European Commission, was not able to find a solution to keep uh, Great Britain. With, uh, within the family, and I'm very sorry that they are responsible. They should be responsible. Liberals, leftists, they should pay for it because it is damaging. Uh, European Union without uh, Great Britain is weaker. Uh, Rus Russia is stronger. And what we can do now is to cooperate and build our relations together as, as much as we can. Jim, uh, do you feel that your question has been answered at all as to the funding uh, for Ireland after Brexit? Uh, slightly diverted. The package is 850 million, I gather, over seven years. Uh, I, I think it's a good start. I'm not going to say it's nothing, but it needs to be, I would, I would guess, about twice that. We need something that really ramps up a recovery across Europe, not just in Ireland. Now, Ireland has specific problems with Br Brexit. Britain is between us and the rest of the EU. It's our biggest trading partner. The EU needs to ramp up. It needs a renewed vision. It needs balanced regional development across the bloc. Otherwise, we'll have the suction force of migration to the very, very prosperous areas. Ireland has always been a victim of that, of migration, but we need a new vision. Jim and Monhan, thank you so much uh, for your opinion. We'll be getting uh, to uh, migration and the future of, of the EU later in the programme, but we need to uh, take a pause uh, for now. More audience questions after BBC World Service News. This is the BBC World Service, concluding our series of US presidential profiles is very proud of his blue-collar background. Being a man of the people, I rode with the press, and you can't get much lower than riding with the press. Joe Biden is president-elect of the United States. The first time I met him, once we were actually competing, he was always so pleasant to everybody. He's often seen as the common man, someone with a tragic history. To lose his wife and his daughter, he almost stopped then. Join me. James Nochte, as we look to the challenges that lie ahead. The Biden administration is going to have to start at 60 miles an hour. This is a moment of awesome, I think, humbling complexity for any president. Presidential Profiles. President-elect Joe Biden. Tuesday at 9 GMT. This is the BBC World Service. I'm Katia Adler in Brussels, and you're listening to World Questions. 
We're debating the future of the EU with a panel of politicians and policymakers and audience members with questions from across Europe. So far, we've discussed the impact of the coronavirus pandemic, the environment and Brexit. Still to come, migrants in the EU and the way forward for the European project. That's World Questions after the BBC World News. BBC News. The president of Uganda, Yoweri Museveni, has described Thursday's presidential election as the, mo the most fraud-free vote in the country's history, thanks to biometric technology. The veteran leader has been declared the outright winner, paving the way for his sixth term in office. The internet was suppressed during the election. Uganda's opposition leader, Bobby Wine, says this helped to hide widespread fraud. Germany's governing Christian Democrats have opted for a new leader who maintained Angela Merkel's centrist, strongly pro-European Union approach. The election of Armin Laschet, the Premier of North Rhine-Westphalia, puts him in a good position to succeed Mrs Merkel as Chancellor. A six o'clock curfew has come into effect across France to prevent the spread of coronavirus. Some doctors want to return to the lockdown, which the curfew replaced last month. They say highly transmissible variants of COVID-19 are a growing threat. Hospitals in the northern Brazilian city of Manaus have received thousands of oxygen canisters from other states and neighbouring Venezuela to help with a surge in COVID-19 cases. They had warned they were running out of supplies. Dozens of patients are being airlifted to hospitals in other parts of Brazil. Reports from Belarus say an opposition leader, Maria Kolesnikova, has lost an appeal against her continued custody in Minsk. She's facing charges of trying to seize power in the country following the disputed re-election of President Alexander Lukashenko. The Iranian authorities say they've seized 45,000 illegal machines used for generating cryptocurrency. Iran's power supply company says they're consuming so much electricity it could lead to blackouts. And archaeologists have announced the discovery of more ancient Egyptian treasures at Saqqara, south of Cairo. The finds include a funerary temple where devotees are believed to have worshipped a dead queen well over 4,000 years ago. More than 50 wooden coffins were also found. BBC News. Hello, I'm Katia Adler in Brussels. This is the BBC World Service and you're listening to World Questions Europe. I'm joined remotely by a panel of leading politicians and policymakers and questioners from across the continent. Um, with me, Eva Kaili, Greek MEP, joining us uh, from Athens, Dominic Tajinski, Polish MEP uh, in Warsaw, Katia Leikert, CDU member of the Bundestag uh, in Berlin, and from Rome, we have Natalie Tocci of the Institute of International Affairs. Welcome back, all of you. Let's go straight into our fourth question uh, of uh, the program. Um, it touches on foreign policy. Lentian Ilias Bileros, a student at the University of Luxembourg, it's over to you. Perfect. Thank you very much for having me. My question has to do with the foreign policy, uh, foreign affairs policy of, uh, of the European Union. So, um, as a multilateral organization, does the EU lack a strong common foreign policy dealing with the external challenges? Uh, will it, for example, be able to be a proper ally of the USA as a new president seeks to take on China? Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Well, let's go to you first, Natalie Tocci of the Institute of International Relations. Relations with Joe Biden. It was terrible with uh, Donald Trump. But let's be honest. What about working with Joe Biden when it comes to containing China? How do you see that? Well, I mean, obviously, you know, uh, as, as you said, Katia, the last four years have been dreadful for the first time in the history of the transatlantic relationship. Basically, uh, there was uh, someone sitting in the White House that looked at the European Union as an enemy, I mean, not as a partner, not as an ally. So obviously this was more fundamentally changed, which means that on pretty much everything, it will be much easier to deal with the United States. Now, this will not mean that on everything we will be exactly on the same page. And I think when it comes to China, inevitably there are going to be differences. When it comes to the United States, the relationship with China is really viewed through the lens of rivalry. So let us assume for the sake of argument that China was a shining liberal democracy, but it was rising <laughs> and it was overtaking the United States. Would the United States have a problem with China? Yes, it would. Uh, would the European Union have a problem with China? No, it would not. Uh, and this is the fundamental difference. So for the European Union, for Europeans, the, the challenge and in fact even the threat that China represents in many respects is even more existential. It really has to do with 
the ability of a country like China to interfere and impinge uh, upon our internal rules, laws, and standards. Uh, we only need to think about the economic domain, uh, but also everything that falls into the box of disinformation, etc. So this is the kind of challenge that China represents. Now, this means coming back to the transatlantic relationship that we will largely converge with the United States, but we will be coming at the China question from different standpoints. What about uh, you, Katya, um, in, in Berlin? If the EU manages to kind of hold together when it comes to China, foreign policy generally is seen as a weakness of the European Union with 27 countries. Uh, we've had Dominic, who has difference of opinion with Germany when it comes uh, to Russia, uh, for example. There's the idea of is should there be an EU army or not? Many differences of opinion. Is this always going to be a weak point for the European Union? Well, it should not, Katya. The EU should really move on in this field and... Um, we here in my parliamentary group we strongly support more common foreign policy. It's really good that um, Ursula von der Leyen, um, she really wants to put Europe in a position that it um, is an actor which has really a lot of impact. That's and, the president um, of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen. Right, and um, I, I personally support a European army, for example. We don't see it as a contradiction to our NATO agreement, and I'm hopeful that the new Biden administration will contribute to renewed um, transatlantic relationship, but we really have to be able to act as European Union. Thanks, Katia. Um, Eva Kaili, if I could uh, turn to you in Athens. Katia is saying that the EU should be more active in foreign policy. It, but this is for years it said the same thing. It wants to be a big actor on the world stage. And yet the divisions internally uh, just bring it, make it seem weak on the world stage. Greece, for example, or Cyprus uh, don't like the idea of having Turkey as, a, as an EU member state, even though officially uh, it, it is still you know, applying to, to, to join the European Union. Do you think this is always going to be a weakness uh, of the EU? So it's a very interesting question because I can connect it also to the trade agreement and the Brexit. So Europe had the chance to have a Brexit uh, fund for the impact for trade because there we have full competency as EU to negotiate an agreement. For foreign policy, we don't have this kind of agreement. We can support, it's an alliance, it's a union that can support each other. But unfortunately, there are double standards. You have to follow the money. You have to see the dependencies of its member states um, for the banking system, for exports of armaments. And this is something that actually is like one of our biggest shortcomings. Um, and Greece and Cyprus, they, they never said something against the country. What we said is international law should be respected and it can never be put on the table of any negotiation. International law because some companies want to have agreements with Turkey, European companies, or because some European member states, they, That's have, right. That's right. they have their own agreements in banking sector or in the energy sector again. We also try to have a, a European common migration policy because once they pass our borders, it becomes a European problem. It's not isolated. And Europe is trying to set a European strategy there. It takes time, but we have progressed. Thanks. If I'm Dominic, can I briefly give you the word on, on foreign policy, if, if you would? Foreign policy should be called hypocrisy and the facts. The facts are that Germany do not pay 2% GDP for NATO. Why? Because they don't care about international allies. They don't care about NATO. They are spending billions on Nord Stream 2 with Putin and not paying 2% which should be paid by the agreement. That's number one. French, they don't care about NATO, they don't care about international alliances, and then, and then they are making the business with Moscow, and they are surprised that the President of the United States is not happy about it, that he's forcing them to do what they should do by the agreement, that he's forcing them to pay 2%. Poland is poorer, much, much poorer than, uh, than, than Germany. We do pay 2% because this is our obligation from our contract, from our solidarity document. Germany doesn't do it. If these two leaders of the European Union don't care about the vaccination, the uh, security and other pillars of the European Union, 
Why should we? Why they want to be bossy and, you know, uh, putting us around? We are not the small children. And that's how they treat us, these Katya, leaders. Can I um, put that to you then? Because Germany is often accused of hypocrisy uh, here. The Nord Stream 2 project that Dominic um, often refers to is a gas pipeline uh, that, uh, that with Russia wanting to uh, sell its gas um, without going through Ukraine. Is it fair to talk about needing to work together on foreign policy, Katya, using those words when in action? Germany is actually working with countries it says the EU needs to be more careful about? First of all, what we see, I mean, it's an, it's an old contract. It's um, not a new development. And um, what we do on uh, European level now is um, to more closely link foreign policy issues, security issues to trade issues. If, if you ask me as a person which is more concerned with foreign policy as well as security policy, I would say that we should um, really put, put more concern on security issues, as Eva mentioned it as well. Still we know it's not that easy all the time. This is the same with 5G decision and Chinese involvement in the European market. I mean, in the end, we are not alone in the world. I mean, it has nothing to do uh, with hypocrisy. It's more that we really should rebuild world order and uh, work together in multilateral institutions like WTO and strengthen these institutions. Lentian, what does that mini discussion make you feel? Uh, reassured that the EU can work together uh, on the foreign policy stage worldwide? Um, I have to agree somehow uh, with Mr. Uh, Tarzinski uh, regarding the, the hypocrisy uh, or let's say the way the European Union actually does with foreign policy. The European Union is, is, an organ is, is a very complicated organization. We know that. And it's really difficult to get 27 now after Brexit uh, countries get aligned uh, as far as concerns the, uh, the, the uh, foreign policy. Thank you thank, very much anyway. Thank you so much for, for joining us on the programme. The next question is Uzoma Hansens. She's a volunteer working with migrants in Brussels, here in Brussels. She was a migrant herself to the EU 25 years ago. Uzoma, if you would put the question to us now. The question is, what would migrant future be in the European Union during COVID-19? Yes, I think it was a bit, a bit longer, wasn't it, that you said that the pandemic was making life uh, difficult Very for them? Very difficult for people, in, I mean, for migrants in, in Brussels and, and in the e European Union as, uh, as a whole. And what is going to be their future? Um, if, if I can come to you uh, in Athens, first of all, Greece, along with Italy, something Natalie will know uh, very well, has seen a disproportionate number of the migrant arrivals uh, to the European Union since the migrant crisis in, in, in 2015. Um, we have seen, though, since the COVID-19 crisis in particular, desperate conditions in the camps and accusations by migrants that the Greek government has been pushing uh, migrant boats and migrants themselves back into the sea and not allowing them to, to land in Greece. The government says that is not true. What is happening and what could make it better? So a very interesting question again. Um, first, let me say that there is uh, no proof for anything. There is an investigation taking place, but nothing similar has happened. Nobody has been in danger. Um, uh, I would say the opposite. Actually, we are a country that has opened borders to um, millions of immigrants the last few years, taking a burden that was uh, actually uh, bigger than we could handle during our crisis. Um, Europe came together to have an agreement, the Migration Pact, where they can address and help us to relocate or return people that should not uh, illegally come to Europe and to make sure that people that come refugees from uh, uh, from countries that they uh, they cannot return they will be taken care of in and uh, uh, actually relocated in several countries of Europe there is um, a huge funding actually also available for Turkey and other countries that will uh, help us to deal with the flows um, let me also say that Turkey is considered to be a safe country for uh, refugees and migrants so this means they have to choose legal ways 
to to enter Europe. So um, I don't even see the basis of, of this criticism. The only thing I can say is that we were not prepared for those flows and that Europe for the first time is now trying to understand that we cannot consider it to be a problem of Italy and Greece. It's a problem of Europe because once you, you uh, enter Bravo. Europe, then it's not easy to understand uh, where these people will uh, end up going to. Um, we are trying to negotiate, I think, by the end of January, we will also have an initial agreement that will be discussed at the, at the Council. The Parliament is now tabling amendments on how we can improve the second migration pact for 21-27, as we saw the problems of the first package. But in the meantime, um, Eva, we still have migrants in, living in terrible conditions in Greece and elsewhere, as we've heard from Uzoma. I mean, she works at, here in Belgium. She works here in Brussels. Dominic, can I, can I turn to you? Because Eva mentioned here uh, re the relocation plans that the EU had to take some of those migrants in the camps in Italy uh, and in Greece um, and put them elsewhere across the European Union. Poland is one of the countries, along with hung Hungary, that strongly opposed that and refused to have the migrants, didn't want to have them, um, and went against that decision, that common decision by European Union member states. Thank God for Poland and thank God for Hungary. I'm not talking about migrants. Please do not use this word because it's, it's inappropriate. Uh, we are talking about illegal migration, illegal migrants. I do believe the lady who asked the questions possess her uh, passport and she pay taxes. So yes, uh, not even one illegal migrant will, will come to Poland ever. Never and ever. I was migrant myself. I had my passport, I had my ID and I paid my taxes. I used to live in London. I used to work in the United States. I had my passport, I paid my taxes, I proved who I am, and I was not a threat to the society by the documents. So again, let me tell you and all the listeners around the Europe and around the globe, not even one illegal migrant will come to Poland ever. Dominic, what can be done, the question is, what can be done to help the migrants who are already inside the European Union that are suffering very difficult conditions during the COVID-19 pandemic in particular. These include small children, for example. Yes, um, we can ask for help. Uh, Madame Merkel, she was welcoming refugees, as she called them. She was shouting and uh, advertising well, uh, where refuse, uh, refugees welcome. If they're welcome in Germany, let them go to Germany. Let uh, Angela Merkel pay for them. We're not going to pay for them. We're not going to pay for someone else's stupidity and irresponsible decisions. We are not going to pay for this. We never had any colony. We never invaded anyone. It's not the uh, Second World War. It's not our fault. Let them pay for it. Katia, uh, in Berlin, you have spoken out last year. You spoke out in favor of taking the, the children uh, from the migrant camps uh, and taking them into the European Union, not waiting, not allowing them to stay there uh, for processing. Germany did famously open its doors to uh, a million migrants and refugees and asylum seekers back in, in 2015. Um, How's that going? Would Germany be open to taking in more, for example, to help now during the, the pandemic? What happened to your suggestion about the migrant children? Actually, Katya, I have children myself, and um, I think this is a special situation. And um, Dominic, if you refer to 2015, it's not 2015 anymore. Uh, yes, it's like it's like 20 terrorist attacks. Do, Dominic, Dominic, could you please let Katya speak? Thank you. Dominic, you're well informed about the figures, and the figures are below 200,000. Um, so we can manage this. And if we if we have space, if we Take face them. special, if Take we them all and pay for them. This is exactly the problem. The problem is um, that your party and your friends are not able to talk about problems and try to uh, offer solutions it's easy just to say take them i mean this is not a political solution them. actually we pay for them we took more than one um, five seven million refugees which is this is what uh, we called solidarity you know exactly that uh, there was a war in it's syria over two you million cannot, ukrainians you in cannot, poland over two million dominic, ukrainians you in please, poland dominic, legally. please dominic okay we we don't say that we did not make uh that we didn't make any mistakes um 
uh, we try to find uh, solutions and for, for the situation, um, let me remind you, there was a war in Syria and the bordering countries took a lot of refugees. We have a responsibility as European countries, which we took on and especially Germany. So let's now, we will always see migration. We will always see refugees. So we have to cope with the situation. We all want to have safe borders. We are a, a community of um, 27 states and I'm sure that we will cope uh, also with this problem. Actually, for me, this is the most severe problem which we have to use. And Dominic, uh, the contribution of your party is really not enough. Having heard from the, the panel now, um, their answers, Uzoma, um, what, what, what do you think? Have they answered your question? No, it has not answered my question because they will come anyway. You, you know that migrants will go to uh, to land. They, they, they would even take uh, the, the, the desert to arrive in Europe. Mm -hmm. So what are we going to do? Even during COVID, it's the worst time, you know, to receive anyone who is coming without any invitation. Uzuma, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm sorry, it didn't feel like your question was fully answered, but, uh, but thank you so much for, for, for joining us uh, all the same. Um, Time now for our, our final uh, question uh, today from Michelle Pellette Kier, a retired real estate manager um, here in Belgium. What is your question, please? Uh, can the EU survive when members disagree with its politics and the EU is not prepared to listen? Several countries are considering leaving. Holland could be one. Poland could be one. Uh, Britain has already left. Will the European Union adapt in order to survive? Can the EU survive when member states disagree with its politics, as we've heard on this programme, and the EU is not prepared to listen? I think I will go, yeah, Dominic, I know I can, I, we can't see you on radio, but I see you on, on my Zoom screen. You would like to answer that first. The idea of Palexit has come up very often uh, since the Law and Justice Party is in government uh, in Poland. Will you push to leave uh, the EU or is this a threat rather than a promise or something that's likely to happen? We will never leave European Union. If someone is unhappy with us as a partner, as a member of the European Union, they can leave. No, we're not going to work on poll exit. I, we think it's a wrong, it's a wrong idea. We will never leave. We will never push. This idea is coming from the leftists. This is a propaganda against uh, against uh, our government. As you know, I am the member of the European Parliament and the member of the ruling party uh, in Poland. Uh, this this idea never came up from uh, from our government, from from our party. Brexit was a mistake. I think, uh, as I said, uh, it weak it weak it's it's just a weakness of the European Union. Uh, and and the Russia is is getting stronger. So no, what we need uh, we need reforms. I think uh, this question uh, is, a, is a is a very good one, uh, as the last one in this program. Because what I heard uh, during this program mainly are the uh, political opinions, uh, and and I'm I'm trying to discuss the facts. We have to remember that European Union is us. It's not a ghost. European Union is 27 countries which are partners, supposed to be partners, with, the same, with the, the same rights and the same duties. And then we've got German delegate, German MEP or German representative, who is telling us to work on solidarity. Where is your solidarity, madam? Uh, where is Berlin's uh, solidarity when you're building Nord Stream 2 and giving us lectures uh, a about Green Deal? Where is your solidarity when you don't pay 2% on, on, on NATO? So this is hypocrisy. This is hypocrisy. So the future of the European Union, depending on us, Poland will never, we will not leave European Union. We're going to work on the reforms. We're going to point out hypocrisy because we do believe that the European Union is a beautiful idea with people who follows their word. So follow your documents, follow your signatures, follow your words, do not be a hypocrite and everyone is going to be happy. Katia, um, I invite you to, to, uh, to respond um, from Berlin. Uh, Dominic is 
somebody who, and you do hear this opinion voiced often by smaller member states uh, in the EU, that in theory all EU countries are equal, but some are more equal than others. Is Germany guilty of that? Well, Dominic um, really finds strong words here. Um, I, I don't think your rhetoric um, is uh, something which um, brings us closer together. I did not hear one idea from your side concerning um, Stop Nord Stream 2. Dominic, thank you. Katia, please, over to you. But, okay, if you, if you look at the future of the European Union, for me it's obvious that we need reforms. I'm sure that the Eurozone and all its mechanisms are not enough to really um, secure our com uh, currency for the future. And I'm happy that we have the conference on the future of Europe and um, Germany will take part in this discussion and maybe we need a fresh start um, in several areas. Um, Eva, can I um, turn to you uh, in Athens? Will the European Union survive going forward? If we look back to the Brexit vote in 2016, there was a, there was a prediction of the domino effect. It'll exit, next it, Frexit, lots of different countries leaving. You don't really hear uh, about that anymore. So is the EU strong going forward or the kind of disagreements we've seen today? Is it going to rip the EU apart? How does it survive? Well, as I mentioned before, criticizing Europe for its shortcomings doesn't mean we don't understand that Europe is the only way for us to go forward. And we saw with the Brexit, it's a lose-lose um, situation. You, uh, we have created an amazing single market. We are improving it. We're overcoming all the obstacles. And in the end, it's helping us uh, reduce inequalities. Is one of the best places in the world to have quality of life. So criticism is just to improve it, is not to destroy it. And uh, after what Greece had, 10 years of, of hard austerity that changed our lives uh, actually forever, and also in Cyprus, you saw that still we want to remain in Europe, we can understand and we can see the benefits of staying. So I don't think that we will talk about any other country exiting, but of course we have to understand also the, the shift of power it has to be more even. So I, I understand we, we brought Katya in a difficult position here because um, Germany is actually uh, in a, one of the strongest countries like France and Italy, uh, but it has to uh, also give up on, it's a very strong position and having um, its own interests um, ahead when Europe can come together and make uh, similar agreements. So I would say we have to be more flexible, we have to try to work things out and we have to stop having double standards if we really That's want right. this to work. But still, Europe needs to stay together, we need to improve our shortcomings and, and I think uh, we can agree to that and you saw already you sent me a microphone and headphones for this interview today and it stuck at the customs union because of brexit it was impossible to to reach my house on time this is just one little example of the new reality of 21. well um thank you everybody for your very strong and very passionate views thank you very much for that and um, that's it for this european edition um of world questions thank you to eva kaili greek mep who has joined us today uh, from athens to dominic tajinski polish mep uh, who joined us from warsaw and to katia leikert cdu member of the bundestag who joined us from berlin and from rome uh, natalie tocci of the institute of international affairs thank you very much to all of you next month we'll be discussing the the global impact of the coronavirus with a panel and audience from around the world. On behalf of our producers, Helen Towner and Charlie Taylor, the BBC World Service and our partners, the British Council, thank you very much, our panel, our audience and to all of you listening around the world. Goodbye, around the world. Goodbye, around the world. Goodbye, around the world. Goodbye, around the world.